Okay. <clears throat> okay. Three, two, one, go. All right, David, cue the music. Let's get this show on the road. No, Daniel, I don't, I don't do the music. You cue the music. That's your job. It's like your only job here. Well, I, I left the music button at home, David. What are we going to do? We, we have to start the show with the music, David. That's what we always do. Yeah, and there's no possible way to add the music later. It's just not, we don't have the technology yet. No. It's like fusion power. Maybe someone will come up with it, though. If they send us billions of dollars of research money, then we might be on to something. Well, you know, David, maybe it works out because this is an unusual episode. I mean, it's not that unusual, but we're trying out a new format. You're right. It's another terrible cold open of Ashes Ashes. That's because there's no research associated with this episode. What? How? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We did no research. This is not a, a show where we dive deep on some existential crisis that the world faces, analyzing it from every different angle, and then coming up with what can we do. No, this is just a casual chat between you and me, David. Yeah, that's right. We are trying something totally new here. So if you only listen to this show because of the research, stop now. Come back next week because this is not going to be fun for you. But uh, we are getting to a point where some of the show topics that we have left that we want to hit are so in-depth and so massive that we need a little bit more time to prepare it. Plus, Daniel here is about to start a new job that's going to take a lot of time. If anybody's in Massachusetts and has pro tips about living in Massachusetts, give us a ring. I'm sure Daniel would love to hear those. Uh, he's he's going to be, it's going to be his first Northeastern winter after <laughs> years of uh, Georgia winters. So he, he's in for a surprise there. But right. uh, all this stuff is adding up and we're not going to have as much time to do this show and all the research that we feel like we really need to. So we're going to try and, and bear with us to transition into a sort of chatty catch up week where we talk about things in the news, what we're currently thinking about or working on. And then the following week will be one of our typical deep dive episodes. And we're going to alternate this going forward unless this system just doesn't work or people hate it. But also, I think another thing that is positive about this that you mentioned, Daniel, is that it gives listeners a chance to actually catch up because <laughs> as tedious as our uh, episodes are to research, it's a lot to also consume. We don't want you all binging those That's right. and getting depressed. So uh, consider these like sort of more lighthearted alternatives to those. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of our episodes are evergreen in a way. We try to present the topics in their entirety, at least as much as we can, coming at it with as, as many angles as possible to really lay that foundation. So there's a lot of previous episodes that if you haven't listened to yet, we encourage you to catch up on that. And you're right, David, I'm moving to Massachusetts. I'm starting a new job. And it sounds like we are trying to make up for the fact that we just don't want to do as much work. But I want to assure everybody that that, that is exactly the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just something we were thinking about because I'm about to start in a new field. I'll be working with farmers and community health networks to not just grow produce, not just improve community health gardens, but also figure out how best to organize people around food access. Uh, we're going to be managing some farmers markets. And this is something, David, that I've been thinking about for a long time. You know, it was a year ago when we interviewed Ian McSweeney of Agrarian Trust on this podcast. And that interview, as well as our interview with Chris D'Alessandro from episode 16, really got me thinking about what I want to do on this planet. And I want to be a part of movements that are implementing ways towards sustainability and more importantly, getting communities involved in that sustainability. And I see the work that I'm going to be doing this year as one side of a, of a two-sided coin where you have land conservation and stewardship. Conservation being the, I guess, more legal process of conserving land through a variety of mechanisms so that you can prevent a developer from coming in and, and tearing down all those trees, ripping that habitat apart for some shopping mall or, or some residential lot. And then the other side of that, which is what I'll be focusing on this year, is the stewardship and community organizing side of that coin where, okay, once that land is conserved or once you have access to land or the people on that land are farming it, or want to start farming it, how do you organize people such that it's egalitarian, so that it respects human dignity, and it respects the soil in such a way that you can really be productive well into the future? So um, I have no experience gardening. I have no experience growing <laughs> anything. 
Um, and, and that's a, a large reason I chose this, this position. Well, I mean, maybe this is actually a good way to start this episode and, in fact, start this whole series of things in that I think it's really interesting how this show that we set out to do to educate, inform, and ultimately, we hope inspire ended up doing exactly that just to you. And uh, I know I find it inspiring and maybe some of our listeners will too. But I mean, over the course of your career, Daniel, over the, the many, many years I've known you, uh, I mean, you graduated college with business degrees, with economics, mm-hmm. education. You went into uh, commercial real estate. Uh, you were briefly a landlord, and I'm sorry to out you <laughs> in front of everybody mm-hmm. on that. Um, like, you are now very radically changing the direction of your life. You're starting over new. Uh, you're taking this big risk, moving halfway across the country to jump into this field you have no experience in for what's basically no pay. Um, and I, that's a lot of drastic life choices and decisions. And uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of inspiring because you, you decided, hey, you know, I'm not comfortable with what I'm doing. I want to make the world a better place. This is a way that I see it possible to do that. Uh, so maybe you can share some of that process and, and how you, you got to here. Well, it was about, I don't know, two years ago, a little bit before, I would say six months before we started this podcast, where I kind of had a a very dramatic shift in my perspective. Uh, Up until that point, I was reading a lot of books, I was searching knowledge, but where this path led me down most often were books that focused on self-improvement, on entrepreneurship, on how to build a business, how to be successful in this world. And that really fell perfectly in line with my business education and and just the way I had come to see the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean, I remember us having arguments over things like effective altruism and uh, these like very tech bro way of seeing the world um, and disagreements. And I mean, it was all very cordial, but it was it was interesting seeing where you were coming from at the time versus where you are now. Yeah, that that was a thing. We were um, we didn't talk that much, but, you know, we had kept in touch. We've known each other from for a long time. And I was actually traveling the world uh, for a year. And I remember we were exchanging emails and which, by the way, everyone, if you search Daniel's name on YouTube, he made travel logs of his his travels uh, backpacking across Europe, and uh, they're kind of funny. So you should you should check those out. Um, yeah, it's funny. Actually, a listener found those independently <laughs> and reached out and said, "It doesn't make sense to me." You know, Daniel and David they talk about this, you know, anti consumption and and the greenhouse gas emissions of traveling. Yet Daniel seems to be just like celebrating the. <laughs> international travel lifestyle i don't i don't understand yeah we uh we, we're very guilty uh people we're trying to work towards better things and we're always trying to improve ourselves and become less and less hypocritical and unlike a lot of podcast hosts in the left field without naming any names we at least do engage in forms of activism uh besides just uh preaching about champagne socialism or whatever so uh, that's me dropping the mic on some people who i'm sure some of the listeners are familiar with yeah, uh, I certainly need to catch up, or I, I certainly could do more and, and trying to do more. But yeah, back to my travels. So we were exchanging emails because I was reading books. I was reading biographies and, and just really buying into this entrepreneurial narrative of that, like, not only can anyone be successful if they just implement the right strategies, but those are the people changing the world for the better. And I remember we even had a, an email, I think the one you're referring to about effective altruism or something, but I remember saying like, look, how can you criticize someone like uh, Bill Gates, who, you know, he was able to amass such a great fortune. And now he's in a position where he can use that fortune to uh, better the world. And so what's wrong with working towards building wealth in your early life so that you can then be a great philanthropist? And if anyone is curious about the change in perspective there, just look up episode 61, Owning Change. But anyway, so we were exchanging these emails and, you know, you were recommending some books to me and I read them. And, and a, lot of, a lot of my yearning for this knowledge came out of frustration, David, because a lot of the conversations we had, you would say things that I not only had never heard before, but really challenged the way I saw the world. And it didn't make sense to me. And to be quite honest, it made me angry. You know, I would come away from some of our discussions thinking, I know David's wrong. You know, how can he say these things? But I just don't have the knowledge to combat him. So let me find out more. And eventually this, this led me to such books like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. And, and that book really shattered my worldview. You know, 
I hate to say it, but I'm very privileged. I, I did not experience really any racial uh, stress growing up. I very much uh, suffered from something called white fragility. If you don't know what that is, just look it up. There's a, there's a paper written about it that it kind of explains how being privileged insulates you from the racial and class oppression that's all around you. And this is, this is something I had to realize and come to terms with. And then in this process, I was reading more and I had this changing perspective where I said, look, I don't know why I was reading so much before, if it was just to accumulate some kind of knowledge, I, I don't know. But I don't want to live on this earth if I can't face the reality of what's going on around me and if I can't adapt to that reality to change the way I live my life. And that was the decision I came to. And I said, I'm going to find out as much as I can about what's going on around me. I'm going to start from scratch. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that everything I was taught in school, uh, including especially college, I'm just going to throw that out the window and start fresh. And I'm just going to take what comes to me and figure out how to adapt my worldview to that. And, and that's what I did. And it's where a lot of my values and principles came from. And I realized that before this time, I actually didn't have values. I didn't really have principles to stand on because I didn't really have a view of the world other than what was just handed to me. And I think this is a big reason why I had so much stress in my early work, because I didn't really know why I was doing what I was doing. Um, but anyway, to close this long story about me, yeah, this podcast just continues to be a source of knowledge for me to adapt my worldview to. And yeah, learning about industrial agriculture, learning about not just how our industry harms our social relationships, but is quite literally destroying the earth really impacted me. And I wanted to change the way I live. And I'm still working on that. Um, but you know, one of the things we're doing, David, is we're preparing a show on the immigration crisis, uh, things going on at the border, but also things going on in our backyard. And just today, I interviewed somebody for that episode. And I mean, this is a topic that's also having a really big impact on me and, and just seems to be one of the major crises of our day. I, w I want to circle back to that, that show that we're working on right now, Daniel, about the border, about these camps, about detention, about migration. But there's one thing you said a second ago that I, I really connected with, and uh, I had a very similar experience, and I, I feel compelled to share it. Um, and you said that in this process of getting to where you are now, you decided one day basically to unlearn everything you know and started fresh, start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And that was very similar to what I did um, a few years before you, you got to that point. And that's the exact same phrase that I use, start from scratch. I had this Interesting. moment, I guess, shortly after I graduated from college and I was reading something. I don't even remember what it was at the time. It, it wasn't anything earth shattering. I would find those books later. Um, and I've always sort of held a lot of the beliefs I do now. They're a lot more refined and, and developed than they were at the time. But at some point I realized I didn't know why I believed any of the things that I did. They, they just seemed to have collected themselves over the years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of influence from your parents. There's a lot of influence from your peers growing up. Right. And it had just coalesced into this like blob of like, oh yeah, you know, this is what I think I believe, or this is what I define myself as. And, and I had this moment of like panic where I'm like, well, I don't actually know where any of this stuff came from. I don't know why I believe the things I do. Mm. And so I just decided that I was going to rip it all down and start over. And I, I actually, I rolled in some online uh, classes, those massively online educational courses uh, that are free unless you pay like a little bit more to get a certificate. I don't remember which university it was through, maybe it was MIT or something. And I took some on um, one on surveillance law. Oh, interesting. I, and I took one on um, specifically the foundation of government and what is government? What is the larger philosophy behind government? And part of the course was sort of to design your own system of government as you went and it, you know, walk us through this what is traditionally seen as the progress of successive new types of government developed over time as they evolve from each other. And, and you know, that idea that history always progresses and we get more refined as time goes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, it's a looking at it now, knowing much more than I did at the time, there's a problematic course. There were a lot of things left out. There's a lot of presumptions that were made in order to push a specific type of view that it was very clear that they wanted students to achieve. But unfortunately for them, it like pushed me in a very different direction. I found a lot of literature that I would have never found before. And I started really developing all of my beliefs, once again, from scratch, going back to the sources, reading the original philosophers who came up with this idea. And and even some people who uh, get a weird 
reinterpretation of their work today. So people like Adam Smith, who is talked about as this hero of, of capitalism, when really he cautions against it quite a bit in his text. Uh, they're actually very interesting. And there's lots of passages that if you told people that he said that, they'd think it was Karl Marx. But mm-hmm. this sort of reworking, uh, it, it's a never-ending process. But so many people that I talk to that get to this point where they're trying to make big differences in the world, big differences in their lives, had a very similar experience where they say they reach something, some sort of event in their life, um, something happens to them. They just all of a sudden reach a breaking point. They say, wait a second, I need to restart or I need to figure things out. I'm ready for a change. And I, I think that moment is so important. And I wish I knew how to create that in people. And I, I hope that some point sort of this show does that for some people. It gives them a chance to say, oh, I never knew about this. And if I didn't know about this, then what else don't I know about? And, and it goes from there. It's one of the explicit goals we laid out when we try to do this, which is why we do so much research and offer so many additional sources so people can jump back down that rabbit hole themselves. But uh, that, that, that moment, that click, that willingness to redefine everything, to shift your worldview, I think is a really important but universal experience in arriving at, at I guess, radical views, but views where you want to do something about it. And it's not just something that you believe in that is is um, amalgamation of however many years of living your life, but actually, you know, a way to live your life, something to live for, something to work towards. And I, I think that's the difference between a lot of people who believe something and then the people who try and work towards that thing. And it excites me. And like I said, it inspires me to see you doing that, chasing that redefining of your worldview and actually putting it into action. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't, I didn't know you uh, like legit signed up for college courses and just sat down and like yeah dedicated your time to just uh i have i have notebooks full of notes um like uh after i'd already graduated from college i'm not getting any credit for these things i was just like okay well you know i gotta restart because i clearly took the wrong classes in college so let me start over here yeah and i'm I'm interested to listeners if you have similar stories we'd love to hear these um email them to us contact at ashesashes.org uh, give us a phone call and record it. And at some point, we will get to that call in show, which we're really excited about. That number, by the way, is 313 99 Ashes. That's 313 992 7437. Or uh, find us on Reddit on Ashes Ashes Cast. Or just type it out in our Discord community, which you can find a link to on the website. It's a great group of people. We love hearing from you there. Uh, but to twist back, Daniel, I, I mentioned I was going to circle back to this. We are working right now on a large show, which is part of the reason why we switched to this format, because mm-hmm. we've been working on it for weeks, and we have at least another month or two uh, more work ahead of us. But uh, it, it's covering all things to do with the detainment facilities all around the country, with uh, the migrants, how they got there, what they're doing now, with the people who work in these places, with the people who are actively trying to shut down these systems who are trying to work for migrant rights. Um, Daniel has been basically jam-packing his schedule, traveling around, interviewing lawyers, interviewing activists. Um, We will be traveling down to the border in the near future to talk to some people there. I don't want to go into too many details. And, And this is sort of returning once again to a point I was making earlier, which is that we're really trying to turn this show into something useful, something that is on one hand evergreen, but also on the other hand, inspirational and and actively uses whatever small platform we've developed here for something good, for something that can split out from here, can be spread uh, virally, that can be spread through the actions of others who are inspired by this. And we really hope that this show and what we're working towards with it will be something like that, because, you know, listening to all this stuff that we talk about, uh, there's a lot of things here that I feel extremely helpless by when we're doing these these shows, Daniel. Like, yes, uh, the one that really wrecked me was was the one where we talked about uh, ocean acidification, deoxygenation, and the general warming of it. I mean, that episode really wrecked me. I felt so helpless. But that's ocean death. Yeah, ocean death, whichever one that is. One way back. Way back. And a lot of these, you know, have similar things. Irreplaceable. Where we're talking about this this mass extinction that's going on. And, you know, we can do little things. And I, I know you found inspiration in these farming episodes, which is why you've made this dramatic change in your own life. But one of these things recently that's been affecting me is are these camps, are the plights of migrants, are the plights of my neighbors um, in, in my neighborhood who I know have worries about this stuff. Yeah. And this feels like a little way that we can do something. And I, 
all these shows that exist anywhere, and I don't want to just limit this to podcasts, but anybody who has a platform for whatever reason, I feel like those things should be used for good, not for selling things, not for advertising. Uh, We have such little time and attention these days that anything that's not actively using that resource to try and build a better world is a waste of time for everyone involved. Mm. And yeah, you know, like I consume trashy media TV, which is something I actually want to talk about. Um, Have you heard of Love Island? No, David, I have not heard of Love Island. It is the trash. I'd like to go there, though. No, no, you don't. It is the trashiest reality show I've ever witnessed, and I want to talk about it briefly and the panopticon that created it. But so, I mean, I, I, I consume crap just like everyone. You can't be on all the time. It's exhausting. But, you know, these platforms should be used for good. Um, and that's what we're trying to do here. And if you think of any way that we can be improving our reach, if you can think of ways that we can develop this border show, these contents about this, make it as great as possible. Or if you just have great resources of like, oh, you have to talk to these people or, hey, my neighbor is a migrant or a refugee or whatever, you know, uh, once again, get in contact with us. Let us know. This is a very long-term active project. We're actively developing it. It's still very much in an amorphous form. We're collecting all this information, resources, and uh, we love everyone helping. If you have a couch in El Paso or Tucson. El Paso. El, El Paso. <laughs> Shoot, I should probably figure that out. Um, if you can help us with pronunciation. Oh yeah, I get those all the time. Wrong. Yeah, but if you have a couch in one of those places, uh, wouldn't mind hosting your favorite podcast uh, hosts. Let us know. Whatever it is, uh, we love any and all help, and we love uh, even people just uh, letting us know if we're doing things right or wrong because we appreciate both. We love publishing corrections because it shows that at least we got some stuff right. And people are bothering to correct the stuff that we didn't. Yeah. And it's interesting you talked about how immigration control in this country was, was a, has been something that's, that's been a weight on your mind, David, because it has with me too. I, I've lost sleep just feeling powerless in, in the face of these, these terrible news. And we actually, again, this podcast is as much for ourselves as it is for you, the listener, because you know, we called each other up one day and I think you were super depressed. I was super depressed. You were like, man, just these these concentration camps, man, you know. Was? Was super depressed? <laughs> That's what Love Island is for. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, so, so we were both on the phone just like, yeah, so what do we do? I don't know, you know? And then one of us was just like, well, why don't we go down there? Why don't we do a show on it? You know, document something, talk to some people, and, and then... We started getting re- revitalized by that idea and, and it gave us a purpose again, you know? And I think that's so important in these dark times. Like, okay, read the news, fine, but then get off, get off the news and go find an organization to volunteer with. And that's something that surprised me. Just there's so many things around you. I guarantee you there's an organization doing something uh, that you can be a part of. And yeah, preparing for this show on immigration, I've already learned so much. I've learned that, you know, people who get stopped at the border, they don't get detained right there all the, all the time. They usually get detained there and then they get sent randomly across the country. You can get detained at the border and then find yourself in New York. Uh, you can get detained at the border and then find yourself in Georgia, which by the way, I've been doing some interviews in Georgia, David, because we have one of the worst situations for immigrants in the whole country. Um, so for those seeking asylum in this country who are, who are running away from violence, who are running away from persecution, the national average that we accept asylum seekers is around 40 something percent. Uh, if you just happen at, to land in Georgia, and again, this is just the roll of the dice, your chance of being admitted into this country on an asylum process falls dramatically to just five or two percent. And of course, there's a whole lot more atrocities being carried out in Georgia. But yeah, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, David, but it's depressing and we should do something about it. Which we're trying to do. So uh, I don't want to hang on this too much and, and give too much of the show away. But uh, I guess all I'm trying to say is that's something we're actively working on. And if you feel like you have anything that could be useful, let us know. We would love to hear from you and we would love your help and involvement and participation. And uh, that's one of the coolest things that's been going on with this show is how willing people are, Daniel, to jump in and help and contribute and offer uh, links and suggestions and advice. And if you go back to the very first episode, which nobody should do because it's not so great and the audio isn't is terrible, but um, 
one of the first things I say, like immediately out of my mouth, is how much I dislike podcasts. Right? Yeah. Why did you say that? Well, I don't like podcasts. Is it just a Brooklyn thing? No, it's not. Everyone in Brooklyn loves podcasts. Though. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like you hate what everyone else loves, and everyone in Brooklyn loves podcasts. So, so like I'm doing it to be contrarian. No, I mean like I used to listen to podcasts more when I lived in Atlanta and I drove a lot. I like listening to them while I drive, but. I don't drive anymore. I don't own a car. So I... Let me stop you right there, David, while you're talking about how much you hate podcasts. I remember this was years ago. uh, We were going on a caving trip, you know, driving four hours to a cave somewhere in Alabama. And you showed up to the carpool with a CD of This American Life episodes that you had downloaded, burnt to a CD, and then (laughs) (laughs) put it into the disk drive so we could uh, have something to listen to on the way there. Well, it was, to be fair, it was like half This American Life and half Radio Lab. And at the time, those were basically the only podcasts worth listening to. But yeah, you know, I, I, I did enjoy them. Um, and Brooklyn definitely did turn me against them slightly because there's a lot of bad podcasts here and there's a lot of uh, bad p- podcast people. Everyone is like, oh, I have a podcast. And then you're like, oh, okay. But um you know, I've, I've sort of come around to them. I, I enjoy them a lot more and I value them uh, much more than I did. And, and not only just for the content, but also just the fact that, I don't know, it's kind of cool that in this age of all this media, in, in terms of like short consumption, in terms of uh, video, of streaming, as somebody who works in these industries, I mean, everything is so focused on catching those eyeballs. And then for some reason, people are willing to put an hour, an hour and a half of their time to sit there and listen to two people ramble. And I think that's really special. And it's it's a throwback to the oral traditions, which was the predominant way of storytelling and sharing information for basically all of human history. And in that sense, I really enjoy this. We're just carrying on this ancient torch. And uh, I think it's kind of cool to look at it like that. So I'm coming around. I'm coming around to podcasts. And uh, all the people in this community have really helped to bring me there. And I had a larger point here, and it, I think it's escaping me. I'm not so good at this format, but it's a work in progress. <laughs> we'll work it out, David. But while you think about that, I agree with you that, that it is cool that people are willing to take time out of their day to just sit down and, or I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're working, maybe they're gardening, but, but just listen to something that hasn't been packaged into this you know, junk food style, dopamine hit form of entertainment. But I also wonder if there's a reason people are craving that type of thing. And, you know, we talked about isolation at one point on the show. We had an episode on that. And I was thinking about this because recently I went to a Lights for Liberty vigil in Atlanta, which occurred in in multiple cities all around the world as a way of, of showing solidarity for those, again, in detention, immigrants being abused and all this. And someone posted about these vigils online. And of course, uh, in this forum, someone said, look, these types of things are useless. You're not going to change anything by these types of protests or, or gatherings or whatever it is. And I was thinking about that, and I really do not agree. And I might have agreed with that in the past before I was more you know, trying to get involved in, in the real life version of these types of things. And the reason I don't agree is because what we lack in this world, in our society so much, are public gatherings. We lack spaces where people come together and talk about the things that are on their minds, talk about the things that give them stress and anxiety, things that they are afraid of, things that they are angry about. And that's really all this was. It was a vigil for people to come together to express their anger, their frustration at what is cruel policies being implemented in this country. And yeah, we didn't change anything necessarily, but again, I don't know if that's always the point because for me, it was a way of meeting new people and reaffirming the idea that we're not alone in the challenges that we face so often. And I was able to go away from that feeling more energized to then go do something. And I think that's what we're missing so much in this world is a way for us to come together, grieve, express our emotions, and then feel empowered to go do something. And, you know, maybe that relates to the way our our cities and our suburbs have been laid out. Uh, We're probably going to do a show on suburbia soon, David. And you know, ever since this country was founded, our property laws have encouraged individuals to kind of section them off from everybody else. And our development has followed suit. And as a result, we don't have very many public spaces. We don't have a civic life in this country. And um, so I think because we lack that, people necessarily have to turn to some of these mediums like podcasts, which 
again, I don't think is a bad thing in of itself, but I would like to see a world where we can get back to a more public and active life where we can share these ideas in person. Yeah, I mean, that sounds so amazing. And I think part of the problem with that is this lack of public spaces, which we've talked about before, which I'm sure we'll hit again in this suburb uh, episode coming up, where there aren't just places to hang out and have these conversations to meet people. There's no public space. Everything has been uh, privatized. If you want to go somewhere to talk to people, you are expected to purchase things in that process. Uh, the only places that were semi-public were malls, which had this overwhelming sense of consumerism, and all the malls are now disappearing as well. So it's almost like uh, the world is being designed to prevent this. There's the, there's a group of evil people who are conspiring to prevent these types of thoughts and interactions. Uh, but uh, the resistance that really is actually in a resistance and not just a hashtag, I think, is trying to push past this stuff and finding these human connections and these human activities, these activist organizations, these people. And, and activism is such a loaded word now. But I mean, it's just ultimately people who are concerned about something so much that they're willing to put time into trying to fix that problem. And that's all we need. We need a lot of that. We need much more because we have some very big problems as we'd love to talk about on this show. And uh, I, I, I know I sound like a pessimist all the time, but I, I think at my heart I'm an optimist because you can't do any of this. You can't continue on. You can't put all this work into stuff. Talk about all these, these problems and things without at some level believing that something better is possible, believing that they can be fixed. And some days it seems more impossible than others, but uh, uh, it, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be clean. And it's definitely not going to be a perfect solution, but I think there are solutions to a lot of stuff. And I think they are, if we crack down, then uh, we might get to some of them. Yeah. Well, and you know, everyone talks about how do we fix these things? How do we solve these things? And of course, that has to be the aim of everything we do. but. There was, there was a time, David, where I came to the decision, and I have to constantly remind myself of this, that maybe we'll never see things fixed the way we want them. Maybe there will never be a day where we can look back and say, okay, everything's solved. But maybe it's the struggle itself that is worth doing, regardless of whether we are victorious or whether we are defeated. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, there's that maxim when you go camping, right? Like, uh, you know, the silly things like, leave no trace, blah, blah, blah. But there's a larger one that's that leave things behind better than when you got there. Um, I think it's there with camping, it's things with stewardship. And I think for a lot of human history, uh, there were groups of people, large groups of people who were doing just that. And of course, there were also large groups of people doing the opposite of that. But uh, if we could get back to these ideas where if I'm going to live my life on the world, I'm going to put more back into it than I take out of it then we're well on our way to actually making things better. But of course, that's going to require much less extraction from uh, each and every one of us. And a lot of the lives that we try and look up to uh, will not be compatible with that kind of, of living with that kind of world. Yeah. But I, this, this is a lot on my mind right now because I'm reading some books, which I guess maybe I should mention what I'm reading. Does that sound interesting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. T tell me what you're reading, David. Well, let me tell you in general what I'm consuming. Um, no podcasts for starters. Um, though I do have a list of podcasts that I need to listen to. There's the episode on the Roma that we talked about in the cashless episode last week from Anthropod, which is supposed to be great. It's been recommended to me several times. Um, the podcast, It Could Happen Here, keeps coming up. And that is the number one podcast on my list to listen to. I'm excited to get to that. Isn't that about the possibility of civil war occurring in the United States? Yeah, I think that's the hook, but I think it's a more appropriately explained as a look at, you know, sort of what we're doing here. These systemic problems that are really deeply rooted in American way of living and the way that we've constructed our country that manifests itself in this increasing polarization that could lead to, you know, potential civil war. But I haven't listened to it, so I might be off base, but uh, I think it's, it's a red herring to look at this kind of stuff. So um, I'm excited to listen to that. And uh, reading wise, though, I'm one of those people that reads like a bunch of books and jumps in between them. And never finishes any of them because of that. So I've got two books right now that I'm really focusing on. Uh, one that I just started and is great so far is called Against the Grain by James C. Scott, which is about an alternative anthropological view at early state formation. And I know that sounds super boring and you're dying and rolling your eyes, but it's actually a really great, super fascinating look at the transition from our hunting, gathering lifestyles, which you probably heard at this point, we work like 20 hours a week. Uh, we were healthier, you know, things were more egalitarian. It was pretty great. 
And so asking the question, well, why would anybody then settle down uh, and create agriculture, which made us short and unhealthy and fucked up our teeth, and uh, then live in cities, which were unhealthy and like had tons of epidemics, wiping people out. So why would anybody make this transition? And he really tackles that question and traditional anthropology and conversations about economics and history say, oh, yeah, it's a natural progression. First, humans were wandering around the world like animals. And then they figured out, oh, if I leave some of these seeds here, they grow. And then, oh, if I can control the growing, then I've invented agriculture. And now that I have agriculture, I want to live right by here and be sedentary. And now I have a city and now my city is a nation state. And then, well, now we've invented democracy and here we are, you know. And now I can sit around and create uh, Love Island. Love Island. Now I can binge Love Island on who. <laughs> and, and we've really been building up to that. No, it's, uh, it, it really throws a wrench in all of that in the same way that David Graeber's debt rewrites early economic history and the presumption that the way that things evolve is, of course, the way that they should be and that everything as it is now is inevitable. And uh, I highly recommend this book. It's really it's one of these earth shattering worldview shifting types of books. Uh, it's in my top five already. I'm like halfway through. Um so that's, that's one thing I'm reading. And on the other side, I'm also reading another book that I've already put in my top five um, earth-shattering books. And this is called The Spell of the Sensuous, Perception and Language in a More Than Human World by David Abram. Um, and this is a beautiful text. It's really well written by another anthropologist who is a, also a magician, as a side note. And his experiences wandering around some cultures in East Asia and other places communicating and learning from groups of people out there and uh, reconnecting to nature in this process and what it means for his experience and relating to the world, to the natural world especially, but also making him completely rethink language, which is something I've been hooked on for a long time. I've been trying to work on a language show for this podcast slowly, and this book is really helping me pull a lot of my ideas in together, and it's giving me words for things that I felt but haven't found the research and bits and pieces for. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. Please check it out. And if you have any books that are like these two that you think I would also love, uh, send them my way. And also, if you have any good like intro to linguistics texts, um, I'm looking for some of those because I, I have no idea what I'm doing. And uh, please recommend them. I would love to hear what you all have. So those are what I'm, I'm reading nonfiction wise. I'm also reading uh, Herman Hesse, Narcissist and Goldman, which is Okay. Good. Okay. I don't know. I'm not quite done with it. <laughs> and uh, and then binging Love Island, Daniel. Yeah. No one really cares about the books you're reading, David. Tell us about Love Island. Love Island is the perfect creation of surveillance and uh, capitalism and uh, the spectacle. It is like the perfect combination of 2000. I guess the first episode was 2015 and everything that's going on in the world and everything that's going wrong with the world. So they take these, is it six? I don't know. There's like five or six hot women and five or six hot guys. It's a British show. Um, and they put them on this island, on this villa, and they have like 80 hidden cameras all over this island. And they make everybody wear a microphone. And this microphone, it literally just like hangs on a necklace and they have a fanny pack that's like plugged into. But apparently everybody just forgets they have this ridiculous looking microphone hooked around their neck. And uh, then they all try and fall in love with each other. And, but the thing is, it's a game show. In addition to this, the goal is to fall in love with somebody. And if you make it to the end of the show, and you can be voted off and stuff, and I'll explain in a second, you find yourself in a prisoner's dilemma in order to win the money at the end. Or at least this is how it's been explained to me. I haven't seen the last episode yet, but... Is it because you have to vote the person that you uh, fell in love with off the island? Well, it, sort of. So, like, you have to decide, do I take the love... You know, like, do we both want love? In which case, if you both say you want love, then you win some amount of money. And if you say, I want love, but they want the money, then they get all the money instead mm. of splitting it. And then if they both say they want the money, no one gets money. Yeah, no one gets anything. So it's, there's a lot of like manipulation and betrayal and all the like juicy drama that everybody wants. But what's crazy is production schedule, Daniel. It's six weeks and they do an episode every single night, six nights. A week. So, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or whatever. And then they get one day off, and then they keep doing it. But the whole thing is all remotely manned. It's all like filmed uh, with no cameramen, um, for the most part. And it's just these people 
trying to throw each other under the bus for money while also desperately looking for some sort of human connection, all while being surveilled by these people who are profiting off of this. Mm. And it's just it's just like this perfect amalgamation of these all these horrible practices, but wrapped up in this like weird British reality show. Mm. And I'm I'm still grappling with it. And I feel like I should. There's definitely like a DeBoer essay in it somewhere. But yeah, that's 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 the media I'm consuming right now. It sounds like it's trying to concentrate the greatest contradictions of living in modern society. You know, someone mentioned on our Discord how when you're a child and you're playing with friends, everyone teaches you the importance of sharing and to be kind to everybody. But then as you grow up, the world basically tells you, okay, now throw that out the window, screw everybody and acquire money for yourself, right? And yeah, I think that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I might have been the one that said that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for your valuable contribution to our Discord community then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come hang out with us. Um, no, it totally is. and But I don't think that that was what they were trying to do. I don't think this is like a biting satire of our world today. I think it's just like a machine generated of, oh, of course this episode or this television show exists. Um, I wish I wish there was a, like a sharper observation there. Well, that's the other weird thing about modern society is like, Everything that would have been a parody like 50 years ago becomes reality. Yeah, exactly. Today we have examples of like Nestle with their slogan, enhancing quality of life while protecting life for the future or whatever it is while while like dramatically destroying the environment. You know, we're just like life itself becomes worse than an onion article. Or like straight up poisoning babies with their like poison baby formula that they were shoving down everyone's throat in Africa. Like a company that is actively about as evil as you can get, but pull up their Twitter page and you see like a mom hugging like a little kid with this like beautiful tree in the background. And that slogan you mentioned, Daniel, enhancing quality of life and contributing to a healthier future. When like literally everything they do is opposite of that, where the CEO is like, oh yeah, water's not a human, right? Sorry. Like, oh, come on. Yeah. But I digress. What you reading, Daniel? Uh, I was, I told you I was watching uh, that anime, Full Metal Alchemist. To be honest, David, like every single episode, like 90% of them is just them talking. And like, I'm like, wait, is this it? Is it just really going to be like this drama the whole time? So it's not as compelling to me as like Attack on Titan or like even like One Punch Man, where there is like a very kind of compelling story that kind of like, okay, well, what's going to happen next, you know? Yeah. So what you're saying is you're not here for the human relationships. You only care about the action. I, I get it. So it's always about the action. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? I don't know. I'm about ready to wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Oh, wait, I, I got a, before we, we start wrapping this up, Daniel, I've got an actual piece of news I, I feel like is worth mentioning. It's sad, though. I don't know if we want to close on a sad note. Um, we'll say your sad piece of news, and then, uh, I don't know, we'll say something to lift people up and close out. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, the reason I'm mentioning this now is because I don't think it fits into an episode particularly in any place. And maybe this is something we'll develop and expand in this this type of episode going forward. If you like this, you know, maybe we can do more of it. But um, it's been hot in Alaska. I mean, it's been hot everywhere. This is the hottest June ever recorded. But it's uh, it's been very hot in Alaska. They, July 4th, they actually canceled the fireworks uh, in Anchorage or mm. Juneau, one of those cities, because it was too hot for some reason. I don't, I don't know. But not only has the terrestrial land been hot, but the rivers and things have been hot too. So in Alaska and in Canada up there, uh, the Yukon River, which is an important river for salmon runs, going back up the river to you know follow their, their biological imperative, to go back to their spawn points, lay their eggs, breed an entirely new generation of salmon, and then ultimately die in the pointless circle of life, is... Um, being disrupted by the extremely high temperatures in the river itself, which has reached 70 degrees and above, which is very hot for that far north. Mm. And salmon metabolism, apparently, because they're so active, because they have so much muscle, when it starts hitting that hot, they have to slow down. Otherwise, they overheat and, and like cook themselves. Mm. And uh, that means they can't make some of these runs and things, and they can't get back to their spawn points. And if they don't make it back to their spawn point, then they don't uh, lay the next generation of salmon, which of course devastates the future of, of salmon. But it also causes this cascading trickle down of ecological effects because ecosystems themselves are always interconnected with everything else. And so without the die off of the salmon, without this vast uh, insemination process, all these things that would normally be trickling down this river, the decaying carcasses of salmon, 
the uh, salmon roe that's everywhere that feeds a huge amount of life. It causes algal blooms, which eventually spin off and uh, feeds whales and, and other animals. Um, some wolves and things eat these roe. Lots of, of scavengers and, and predators eat the salmon themselves. All these things are now being destroyed because the salmon, who are a fundamental core of this large ecosystem because they're just so calorie rich and there's so much of them, they are now all failing because this salmon run is being interrupted. Um, a marine biologist was tweeting the other day that they've been looking at these whales that depend on the salmon for their consumption right off the coast. And because the salmon aren't coming in because they're not participating in this process correctly, all the whales are either not showing up or dying. And that's why we are starting to see so many beached whales more than any other time in, in the recent recorded history off these coasts, in addition to probably, you know, like weird naval testing and stuff. And, and the whole ecosystem is, is exploding and, and, and falling apart because of this temperature thing and just because the water's getting too hot Mm. and nope nobody thought about this no one thought this would be a problem no one expected this to be a problem certainly not this early maybe at some point and i think it really highlights these unforeseen interconnected ways that everything is tied together and Mm -hmm. it's it's not just the salmon this insect apocalypse has the very same chance of doing a similar thing to ecosystems all around the world salmon are a fundamental part of the ecosystem up there. Insects are a fundamental part of the food chain all around the world. Everything builds up from that. In the oceans, of course, krill, uh, plankton, these are the fundamental parts of it. And they're being interrupted. And so the very basis of the food chains all around this earth are being destroyed by climate change mm. already. Mm-hmm. And we're barely getting close to one degree Celsius right now above the, you know, the IPCC numbers, 1.2 for pre-industrial numbers. Uh, we're well on this process to wrecking the fundamental chains that tie us all together, that tie life to each other. And who knows what'll be the case when that happens. And uh, that's really not written into the IPCC. It's barely written to the IPBES report. So uh, hold on to your butts, I guess. Yeah, th- that seems to be the two most difficult things about understanding climate change. I mean, this is not something that's taught enough, I don't think, but maybe it's just because we don't understand it. But it's the unpredictability and the way the foundations of ecosystems are destroyed. And, and that itself carries a bunch of unpredictability. Like we, we simply cannot possibly model or, or predict how disruptions, major, major disruptions to so many of the interconnected systems of our earth result in these dramatic consequences. And it's terrifying. Um, but you asked me what I was listening to earlier. Uh, I have been listening to a podcast called Encyclopedia Botanica. It's all about home gardening, David. It's all about how to grow a garden, how to take care of it, how to introduce native species. Um, so listen to that. Take your mind off some of these larger existential crises and grow some tomatoes. I actually started listening to that after you mentioned it the other way, Daniel. I, I listened to an episode on really beets and uh, some on tomatoes and container gardening. So yeah, I'm actually I'm I'm thinking about oh maybe I should put a window box up in my window and and grow little things. But I gotta check with my landlord and stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're they're actually really good episodes. Each one is usually on a specific gardening technique, whether that's the ones you mentioned or there's a good one I listened to on cover cropping and how. It's not always useful for home gardens. Because- oh, yeah. I listened to that one, too. <laughs> best of. I'm hitting the, the best of episodes right here. Interesting. Wow. We're on sync with this, with this podcast here. Yeah. We didn't even talk about this, y'all. This is just us vibing. Good vibes. I'm actually surprised you listened to the cover cropping one because I had to go back like a year in their show list to just find that, like find one. I think that was like their 17th one or something. Yeah. Well, I went back and I started on some of the original ones and I was like, oh, the cover cropping. That sounds interesting. <laughs> then I played it. <laughs> yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Check it out. Remind yourself that you can experience diverse habitats right where you are and watch it play out. Yeah. And you can work to end that insect apocalypse by ripping out your lawn. But you already know how I feel about that. Well, thanks for sticking with us on this new format. Um, hopefully, You know, if you're contributing to the Patreon and you say, oh, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for one highly researched show every single week and and I'm not getting that. So you decide to adjust your pledge. We understand. If you decide, you know what? I'm tired of listening to a deep dive every week. I want more conversational shows. I want to 
increase my Patreon pledge, or you know what, I'm going to become a Patreon pledger for the first time. All of those decisions are fine. Whatever works for you, we encourage you to do that. Help us out if you if you want to. It's patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. And if you decide that you need a desperate deep dive right this second to hit that itch, well, lucky for you, we have a giant backlog. In fact, there's 97 hours, I think, of episodes that we've recorded so far and have released on our website, which you can find including the full sources and transcript of everything at ashesashes.org. You can also find the link to this episode and uh, find a link to that paper Daniel mentioned, links to the books I brought up and the podcast. So everything will be there and click around, see what you, what you can find. We'd like to thank our associate producers, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us, give us some comments, uh, criticisms, feedback, Again, that email is contact at ashesashes.org. And what's that phone number, David? That phone number, which we're going to use these recordings for call-in show at some point. And if not, we just like listening to them. But 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. Or if you don't like talking on the phone, because let's face it, who does? You can reach us on basically every social media network at Ashes Ashes Cast. We have awesome Instagram. We have a mediocre Facebook. We have a awesome Twitter. Uh, our Reddit community is killer, Ashes Ashes Cast. But best by far is all of our homies on the Discord, which you can find a link to and join a uh, hundred and something, 200 people of your closest friends that you've never met yet but are just waiting for you. Uh, that link is on our website. Just click the community button. Find the invitation link to Discord, and then you can, too, join this chat. There's apps for your computer, there's apps for your phone, or you can interface with just a web browser. We're there all the time, and we'd love to have you join us. Next week, we'll be back to a regular deep dive episode, so uh, don't worry. This is not a permanent switch, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about and uh, a lot to read before we, <laughs> we finish wrapping this one up, huh, Daniel? <laughs> yes, we do. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Boom. Done.